Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about the theory of island biogeography. The world's oceanic islands differ remarkably in terms of species richness. As an example, let's think about vascular plant species. The island of Madagascar has more than 12,000 species. St. Helena, on the other side of Africa, hosts around 420 species. And Marion Island, to the south of Africa, has less than 40 species of vascular plants. Obviously, some of this variation reflects differences in climate and evolutionary history, but we see the same type of variation in species richness, even in small areas. We can look, for example, at the 16 islands offshore of South Africa's west coast. You can see them numbered there. And we can see that the plant species richness shown here in red, varies between zero and around about 200 vascular plant species on these islands. So again, even within a small area, there's lots of variation across these islands in terms of the number of species they host. This variation in species richness between oceanic islands is also seen in other taxa, in other words, other groups of species. For example, this image shows the richness of mammal species across several islands in Southeast Asia. Note how the number of mammal species ranges between 6 and nearly 130 across just some of these islands. So what then drives this variation? As we've already said, if we're comparing tropical islands with Arctic or subantarctic islands, then climate will play a role. With harsher climates limiting the number of species that can occur on an island, because only species with adaptations to survive harsh conditions can survive there. Similar islands, but in milder climates, would likely have higher species richness since more species can cope with the conditions on those islands. But within a single group of islands that share roughly the same climate, other factors must be driving variation in species richness. This is exactly the question that grabbed the attention of two ecologists, E.O. Wilson and Robert MacArthur. They theorized that the size and the isolation of islands would strongly determine how many species occur on those islands, particularly through the effect of island size and island isolation on the colonization and extinction rates of species on those islands. Their ideas were formalized as the equilibrium theory of island biogeography. Just to be clear here, isolation refers to how far an island is from an area where species could colonize the island from. We typically say isolation reflects the distance between an island and the mainland area where all the species that potentially could colonize that island occur. To understand this theory, let's imagine a scenario of a new oceanic island formed by an undersea volcano. And this island is formed near a large previously existing habitat, what we'd call the mainland. Due to natural dispersal, we'd expect that plants from the mainland would eventually arrive at the island and establish there. For example, we'd have species of mangrove trees and palms that occur along the southern African coast, dispersing to the new island on ocean currents. And then, through time, we'd expect to see more and more species arriving at the island until we have an island with a roughly stable number of species occurring on it. Okay, let's go a little deeper into this now thinking specifically about colonization and extinction rates and how they will change through time. In other words, how will colonization and extinction rates differ between islands soon after the island was formed compared to many years later when lots of species already occur on it? So, on this graph we've got the rate of colonization shown in blue and that's plotted against species richness. So we would expect that species from the mainland would gradually colonize the new island, with this colonization rate declining 
as more and more species colonize the island. Now this would occur simply because there are then less species on the mainland that haven't yet colonized the island as we get more and more of those mainland species colonizing the island. So for example at the beginning every species that arrives at the island is a new species for the island. However later on when many species are already on the island when an organism then arrives at the island the chances are high that other members of its species are already there and therefore colonization rate decreases as species richness increases. In other words we can imagine a new island when there are no species on the island the island will experience a high colonization rate since any species that successfully dispersed to the island will represent a successful colonization event. However as more and more species colonize the island the colonization rate has to drop representing that some individuals that disperse to the island are members of species that have already colonized it. The species that have colonized the island though aren't guaranteed to occur on the island forever and as more and more species colonize the island there are more and more species that also can potentially go extinct on the island. In other words when there are no species on the island the extinction rate is zero and when there are many species on an island the extinction rate is higher simply because there are more species that each potentially could go extinct. There's also another uh, more biological reason that we expect higher extinction rates on islands with more species and that is because on these species rich islands there's a greater potential for negative interactions between species like competition, predation and parasitism all of which can contribute to increasing the chance of a species being lost from the island. The balance then of colonizations and extinctions on any one island will determine the species richness of that island. This is why we speak of the equilibrium model. It means that the model is predicting the number of species that will exist on the island when colonization and extinction rates are balanced. In other words, when those rates are in equilibrium. We see this on the graph as the point where the two curves intersect. In other words, where colonization and extinction balance each other out. So where it gets interesting now is when we adjust these curves for islands of different sizes or different levels of isolation. So let's think then, how does island size and isolation link with colonization and extinction? Well, bigger islands are more likely to be colonized since they represent bigger targets for species to disperse to. They will also have lower extinction rates since species can have larger populations on bigger islands and therefore have lower probabilities of going extinct. As a result when we compare a larger island to a smaller island we see that the intersection of the two curves occurs at a lower level of species richness therefore predicting that smaller islands will have a lower equilibrium species richness than larger islands. Less isolated islands also have higher colonization rates and lower extinction rates although for different reasons. When an island is less isolated in other words closer to the mainland it is more likely to be colonized by species since species with good or with bad dispersal abilities have a chance to successfully arrive at the island. For isolated islands located far from the mainland there will be a smaller number of species with the ability to disperse that far. Less isolated islands also have a lower extinction rate. This is because an individual species will have a lower potential for extinction when there's more frequent dispersal by individuals of that species from the mainland to the island. In other words, a declining population on an island can be rescued by new individuals dispersing to that island from the mainland. Therefore, 
When we compare a more isolated island to a less isolated island, we see that the intersection of the colonization and the extinction curves occurs at higher species richness values. Therefore, island biogeography predicts the highest species richness on large islands close to the mainland. In other words, large islands that are not very isolated. In contrast, the lowest species richness would be expected on small and isolated islands. It's important to note, however, the theory only predicts the number of species on an island, not their identity. This is because it expects species composition to change through time. In other words, the theory predicts that through time there will be continuous extinctions and colonizations. So the species on an island would potentially change from time to time. But the balance of colonization and extinctions is expected to remain roughly the same, in other words, in equilibrium. And as a result, species richness will be roughly similar. The changes in species composition that occur through time is what we call turnover. And it's important because it suggests that in a natural system, we expect to see change. In other words, even in a relatively short time period, there can be changes in which species occur on an island. So all of this sounds like a nice idea, but do our observations in the real world support it? In short, yes. There have been excellent studies that have tested the ideas of island biogeography, with many providing support for the predictions of the theory. For example, in a very bold experiment, Dan Simbolov, who was a student of E.O. Wilson, who of course was one of the two ecologists who developed this idea initially, he looked at the invertebrates living on small mangrove islands, just like this one in the image here. After documenting the fauna of each of six of these small mangrove islands off the coast of Florida, he wrapped them up in big plastic sheets and fumigated them, killing entirely all the insects and other invertebrates in the tiny islands. He then monitored the animal species colonizing the islands for a year and found that islands were colonized by roughly the same number of species after one year as that had occurred on the islands before they were fumigated. Therefore, the species richness on the islands returned to roughly the same equilibrium richness as the islands were recolonized after fumigation. He also found turnover, again in line with the predictions of the island biogeography theory, with changes in species composition occurring through time. You can see this in this extract from his results. Now, in this table, each row represents a different species, and each column represents a different time at which he recorded the species on this specific island. The first column shows the initial species richness, and the last column shows the species that were there roughly after one year of recolonization after fumigation. Filled cells represent when a species was recorded, and the empty cells represent when a species wasn't found. And what is really clear here is that some species colonized this island, but didn't survive on the island continuously, and therefore there was this continuous change in the species composition on this island, and indeed on the other five that he studied. As an example, look at this moth species. You can see there, in the initial pre-fumigation survey, the cell was blank. So it wasn't present on the island before fumigation. What you though do see is immediately after fumigation, it colonized the island and it stayed present on the island for the whole year after fumigation. We can see a different pattern for this parasitic wasp. This species was also absent before fumigation. Then it dispersed to the island. You can see there are a few cells that are filled, but it did not persist on the island. In fact, twice it seems to have colonized and twice 
it seems to have gone extinct. Finally, this ant species occurred on the island before fumigation, colonized the island after two months, and then didn't go extinct on the island for the rest of the year. So this then nicely illustrates island biogeography, uh, island biogeography theory's prediction that island communities should be dynamic, with species colonizations and extinctions occurring the whole time. Another classic test of island biogeography theory was conducted by Jared Diamond. He surveyed the bird communities of the small islands offshore of California and found that, compared to an earlier survey conducted 51 years previously, the number of species had only changed slightly on these different islands. In other words, he showed that those um, numbers of species were in equilibrium on those islands. However, he also showed that the composition of the communities was remarkably different between the first initial survey and his repeat survey 51 years later. There was turnover ranging from 17 to 62 percent. In other words, colonization and extinction events had altered which species occur on those islands with some big changes in species composition. Okay, but what about the influence of island size and isolation? Here we also have good evidence from multiple studies that support the theory of island biogeography. Let's come back to South Africa now, and we're going to look at our offshore islands in the southwestern Cape again. Here we can see the same pattern of species richness increasing with size for six different groups of species, six different taxa. I've plotted these results for three taxa. In each of these three graphs, on the x-axis you can see we have island area, and on the y-axis we have species richness. You can see, starting from left, going to the right, a positive relationship between island size and the richness of vascular plants, the same positive relationship with birds, and the same positive relationship between island size and the richness of insect species. We can also look at islands globally. Holger Kreft and colleagues recently examined the plant richness on 488 islands globally. In this image here you can see how much variation in species richness there is between these islands. The sizes of the circles here indicate roughly how many species occur in an island, with larger circles showing there are more species in an island. They analyzed the data in a number of ways and found that area was the best predictor of plant species richness on these islands, followed in second place closely by island isolation. You can see this in the two graphs, where on the left species richness is on the y-axis, and in this first graph we see a positive relationship between area and richness as predicted by the island biogeography theory. In the graph on the right hand side, we see a negative relationship between distance and species richness. Here, distance is their measure of isolation. In other words, the greater the distance from, of the island from the mainland, the greater its isolation. In both graphs, you see there are four different lines. The green, red, and blue lines represent different types of islands. But here it's worth just focusing on the dashed black line because this represents the overall pattern across all of these islands. So at a global scale we see strong support for the predictions of the island biogeography theory. Let's look at just two examples here again. Madagascar is a large island close to the continent. And therefore it's high species richness because it's easy for species to colonize it and because the species can all have large populations with a low chance of extinction. The other extreme would be a small and isolated island like St. Helena Island, which, as we predict, has low species richness. So island biogeography theory therefore clearly has value for understanding variation in the species richness 
of oceanic islands. But what about mainland areas? Well, a key point that emerges is that island biogeography theory can be applied to any habitat that acts like an island. In other words, any patch of habitat separated from other similar habitat by a different ecosystem that's uh, distinct can be considered a habitat island. So the ideas of island biogeography can be useful for patchy environments like, for example, caves, which are separated from other caves by areas that are very different habitats. The same is true for alpine areas. In other words, the high altitude areas on mountains, because the tops of mountains are separated from each other by much warmer and therefore different lowland areas. Indeed, we can see that for some types of habitats that are distinct from their surrounding habitat and for some groups of species, that the predictions of island biogeography theory hold even in terrestrial environments. For example, studies have shown that groups of isolated caves and high-altitude peaks indeed do show patterns of increasing richness with greater island size, island patch obviously here size, and with lower isolation. You can see in the first graph on the top left here how larger caves will contain more bat species in agreement with island biogeography's predictions. On the bottom row on the left the graph shows how the size of alpine mountain area gets bigger and so the number of plant species in these alpine peak islands also increases. In this graph we've got two lines. This represents berry producing plant species which are of course expected to have good dispersal by animals as well as non-berry producing species which are expected to have poorer dispersal. And importantly in both cases the relationship between mountain peak area and species richness is positive. In South Africa there's also been work that showed that Feinbos fragments surrounded by forest vegetation showed higher plant species richness in larger patches. Okay? Again suggesting that the isolated patches of Feinbos located within the sea of forest also behave just like oceanic islands would, following the predictions of the island biogeography theory. Let's wrap up by thinking about the conservation implications of island biogeography theory. Let's start just by looking at an aerial image of an area where human habitat transformation has fragmented a natural habitat. This process create, creates islands of habitat and separate those patches of habitat with other dissimilar habitat types. In this image you can see an area of Brazil's Atlantic forest. There's a clear mainland area of forest on the right and the little islands of remaining natural forest occur all around that mainland. I think there are two key points here that island biogeography theory can tell us about these islands of natural habitat. First, we expect a decrease in species richness in the remaining habitat areas, the remaining islands. This results from smaller islands having lower colonization rates and higher extinction rates. As an example here, as we decrease patch, habitat patch size, in other words, as our island of natural habitat gets smaller, we increase extinction rate and lower the equilibrium species richness. Thus we'd expect fewer species on this now smaller patch or island of habitat. We'd expect a similar effect from lower colonization rates to simultaneously occur too. Second, when we are planning conservation efforts, island biogeography theory suggests we want to conserve patches or islands that are large and that are close to other patches of the same habitat to maximize colonization opportunities from a big mainland patch to the other patches. This will also minimize extinction risks. 
We can also see that conservation interventions that increase the size of reserves or effectively reduce the isolation of conservation areas should also favor the conservation of more species by lowering extinction rates. Creating habitat corridors that connect reserves, in other words that act like a bridge between two oceanic islands, would be an example of a conservation action that's in line with the theory of island biogeography. The idea that conserving large patches of habitat has been particularly influential. And there's been a lot of debate about whether we should follow the logic of the island biogeography theory and focus on conserving large areas of intact habitat or whether we should invest in conserving smaller but potentially more unique islands of habitat. The debate is well beyond our scope for now and depends largely on what aspect of ecosystems you're trying to conserve. But if you're interested, there's a broad literature considering the so-called SLOSS debate. That stands for single large or several small. If you're interested in this, you can read up more on it in the literature. Okay, I hope you've learned something here today, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions on this topic.